Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier podcast. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ellen Avora, a psychiatrist who is taking a fresh and holistic approach to mental health. While she can and does prescribe medication, she prefers to take a closer look at one's diet and lifestyle first to see if changes in those areas could address the root cause of mental health issues. She takes the whole person into consideration, focusing on everything from physical health, sleep, nutrition, digestion, thought patterns, relationships, creativity, connection with nature, and the ways we find meaning in life. Dr. Vora graduated from Columbia Medical School and is a board-certified psychiatrist, medical acupuncturist, and yoga teacher. In this episode, she will be sharing tips for dealing with common mental health issues like stress, anxiety, and depression from a holistic standpoint. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to share with you about a couple brands that I love and help make this podcast possible. If you're looking to improve your health, and especially if you want to improve your digestion, you have to check out the probiotic brand Hyperbiotics. It's the most effective probiotic that I found on the market, and it's the brand that I personally use and recommend to all of my clients. It's so effective because it's made with 15 different strains of probiotics that have been scientifically shown to benefit digestive and overall health, including weight management, reproductive health, and mood. They're also clinically shown to be 15 times more effective than the common probiotic capsules that you'll find at the health food store. Hyperbiotics has helped many of my clients and myself get rid of bloating, increase regularity, and maintain a flat stomach and healthy digestion. For being so high quality, you expect them to be super expensive, but they're extremely affordable at just $25 for a one month supply. Plus, you get an additional 20% off with the code HYPERMARIA. Head to hyperbiotics.com, that's H-Y-P-E-R-B-I-O-T-I-C-S dot com, and use the code HYPERMARIA for 20% off. If you're looking for all-natural skincare products without harsh chemicals, useless fillers, or other nasty things you don't want in your bloodstream, check out Primally Pure. It's a California-based skincare line that started from a farm, so you can bet that all the ingredients are all natural yet extremely effective. I love their beauty cream, fancy face serum, and deodorant. Head to PrimallyPure.com and use code MARIA10 for 10% off your order. Dr. Vora, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Maria. It is great to be here. To start, I'd love to learn how you got interested in a more holistic approach to mental health. Is that something that you learned in medical school or that you picked up along the way? Yeah, it's nothing that anybody ever taught me, but for me, it was like pure survival. I was in med school, in residency, just so burned out and in a bit of a crisis of disenchantment with what I was learning. I felt like I just did not feel in alignment with the way conventional medicine was being practiced and being taught. And I looked around at my patients, the patients in the hospital, and I just thought, this is a crazy system. I didn't really feel like we were ever truly creating wellness or health or vitality. We were sometimes keeping people alive, but sort of in a very, like there was just so much backwards about it. Like you would be giving people powerful antibiotics and powerful medications, but then the food that was being served to people in the hospital was like, you know, almost just as equally powerful at getting people sick. And so it was just felt like a really broken system. And so I was in a crisis about what I was being taught and what I was being trained to do as a physician. And then I was also in a crisis in my own health and well-being and just really not feeling well. I felt like a machine where all the springs were popping out in every direction. So I was just on my own personal journey of figuring out how do I feel well in my body? How do I help my patients genuinely feel well? And that brought me to all of these different holistic approaches to healing 
And that's, you know, I never really knew where this path was taking me. It wasn't like I had some bird's eye view of like, if I just train in acupuncture and yoga and nutrition and functional medicine, then I'll be functional medicine, yoga, acupuncture, psychiatrist. You know, I didn't know where it was going, but it, you know, I always was hopeful that maybe I could incorporate all of these different tools in my practice. And then it turns out they absolutely do work together cogently and make sense as a way of approaching mental health holistically. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about our health. It's not just one thing. It's not just nutrition. It's not just exercise. It's not just one thing. One thing. It's all the things. So it makes sense that they all sort of fit together like puzzle pieces now. Yeah. Usually for every single person, it's more than one thing. And then for every different individual, it's a different assortment of different things, if that makes sense. So I I find that I'm always humbled by the fact that I'll I'll have one patient. I'm like, okay, here's what really did the trick for this person. And then there's always this bias where you you approach the next patient that reminds you of that person. And you're like, okay, I know what works here. <laughs> and then it always ends up being different. Right. Uh, so you have to stay really humble and nimble and really adaptable to the new situation because each person, you're going to use a different combination of strategies and tools and what's really going to make the shift. Right. I always say it's so important to look at one's bioindividuality because each of us is so different and unique. So what works for your sister, what works for your best friend doesn't necessarily work for you. And that's why we really need to be more conscious of what's going on in our body and listen to our body versus just blindly following the trends. Yeah. So mental health, I think in recent years has become more of a topic that we talk about in public or we talk about in the media, but it's still a very small amount of airtime. And I think there's a lot of stigma around it. Nobody really wants to talk or admit that maybe they're struggling or feeling depressed or anxious or really overwhelmed. So I'm curious in your practice, what are some of the most common issues that you see? And are there any trends among, say, different age groups or genders in terms of mental health issues that people face? Yeah, yeah, it's, the stigma is really outrageous, right? And it's sort of like, I think it, it's born of years and years ago, we almost thought of depression as like this mental infirmity, that it was like you were somehow, it was a moral failing or something along those lines, or like, yep, you know, you just have to pull up your bootstraps and, you know, that's what the world expected of you. And like, thank God, I think for the most part, we've moved past that. And it's just that looks absurd at this point. But in certain ways, we've moved in weirder directions around it. I think that there's still a a residual hesitation to be open about mental health, and there's still plenty of shame around it. And maybe now people are feeling more comfortable talking about their depression or their anxiety, but it's still a little bit edgy to say like, oh, I'm taking such and such medication. You know, That's still really vulnerable and really exposing, not to mention the fact that these things can be used against you in terms of insurance coverage and even employment. So all of this, like there is some real reason to be hesitant to be open about it, which I think is unfortunate because I always think the more we can be open and talking about things and honest, and that helps us all feel connected to each other. It helps us all learn from each other. In my practice, what I see is... I, you know, in terms of trend, the major trend is just obviously I'm biased because I see people who come in to see a psychiatrist, but it seems so epidemic to me these days that people are feeling disconnected and despairing and depressed. People are very anxious. There's a lot of poor motivation and poor attention and focus at work. A lot of people are struggling with sleep and just so many people are not feeling a sense of contentment or ease or fulfillment in their lives. A lot of people are feeling, whether we call it depression or if we call it anxiety, people are feeling a sort of a pit of their stomach, uneasiness, kind of 24 seven. And why do you think this is like, what do you think? Is it social media? Is it our phones? Like, what is it that's causing all of these feelings? <laughs> Get comfortable. Um, I mean, <laughs> my, my full answer to that question would take many, many, many hours. But basically, I'm writing a book on this right now. So sort of why are we all anxious? And what can we do about it? So I have no simple single answer to it. But I think a lot of things contribute. While there's some things that are pretty well understood at this point, like the role that social media plays in depression and anxiety, people feeling like they're comparing their life to other people, but also just the fact that it's taken the place of 
in real life physical connection. And so it's like an opportunity cost for actually connecting with people, making a part of the brain almost feel like you got that itch scratched, but you didn't really in a neurochemical way. I think of it almost like artificial sugar tricks your mouth into thinking it just ate something sweet, but you didn't just have real calories. You know, it's problem. Artificial sugars are problematic in other ways as well, just like social media, which I think has us staring at screens and, you know, even the position that our eyes are in when we're staring at screens, I think contributes to anxiety. It's almost like this look of terror when you're just staring at something and that there's always a two-way street. Terror in your brain could make your eyes go like this. But if your eyes are like this, just staring at a screen, it's going to feed back up to your brain as well. And so I think staring at screens, even that alone is contributing to anxiety. That's one small piece of it. I think that there are big issues, I think, around physical health. And this is sort of the under the radar one that I like to start with with patients. It's the low hanging fruit because it's easier to change. You can change it pretty quickly and you can see really big results really quickly by changing physical health. So that's things like so many of us are running around on a blood sugar roller coaster these days because the American diet is built on a foundation of refined carbohydrates and coffee drinks that are actually milkshakes and rosé. So everyone (laughs) is just constantly their blood sugar swinging back and forth. And each blood sugar crash for some people, that is experienced as anxiety. So that alone is a big factor. Even just our love affair with like dark coffee and these huge Starbucks coffees, like we're getting in so much caffeine and we're so addicted to a certain amount of caffeine that to not be in caffeine withdrawal, we keep consuming more and more, but then that heightens our stress response and we're more stressed and more anxious because of that. The gut health is an enormous factor with unease, anxiety, depression. Really, we need our gut to be in a state of diverse bacteria, not inflammation, not intestinal permeability. And modern American life is pretty much systematically designed to compromise all of those aspects of gut health. Just being born at increasing rates by C-section, lower rates of breastfeeding, antibiotic exposure, both directly that we take it as medicine, but also the fact that it's in our poultry, it's in our dairy industry, and it's even residually in our tap water. So we're decimating our gut flora and then our Food is sprayed with the pesticide Roundup and the active ingredient glyphosate contributes to dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in gut flora, and then even to leaky gut. So this is making us very systemically inflamed in our bodies, and that's contributing. So that was a mouthful. (laughs) Pause there. And you can read the book for the rest of it. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's it almost feels like everything in our modern life is trying to take us down in some way. And, you know, it's funny. So I'm here in Dubai and my fiance's grandfather, who just turned 92, is here visiting. And he is the cutest man you'll ever meet. He's still walking. You can have a full conversation with him. He's in great shape. He does yoga poses. So he's Indian. Mm. So he tells me he eats everything. He drinks everything. And he has normal life. He doesn't worry about organic. He doesn't worry about any of the stuff that I'm preoccupied with. And he's trying to tell me like, no, look, I'm 92. And I've had a great life. So you know, you don't have to eat organic. You don't have to do this. And, you know, I think it's different, though, because he, first of all, lives in a different time, a different country, and he doesn't realize it. But some of the main factors that colored his his life and his diet have been the healthy factors. So, for example, to him, the most important, I actually asked him, I'm like, what is the secret to living a long and healthy, happy life at 92? And he told me family. And he said that the most important thing is having your family close by. And he's always had, you know, the family's always together, always eating meals together, always calling each other for every occasion. And and he has a great, great relationships with his family and those around him. So I think that's really important in keeping him healthy. And he's eating a vegetarian, mostly vegetarian Indian diet with lots of turmeric and mustard seeds and all these great spices. And he's doing yoga, he's doing meditation, right? So to him, these are just normal things, which most people don't do. But I think this has really contributed to him being relatively healthy 92. So yeah, you know, when you're saying we need to think about organic, and we need to think about our gut lining, like, it just doesn't common sense to most people that we have to think about these things, but it is really important. 
So let's dive a little bit into the gut health aspect. And so you mentioned that, for example, your gut lining, that's really important for our mental health and really our overall health. So what are some of the food that we should be watching out for that could be damaging our gut lining? Yeah. And I want to tie this into your kind of future (laughs) grandfather-in-law because I I just, I love that story. And I love meeting a healthy, happy 92 year old. And this is, you know, sort of my favorite anthropological way to explore the world. I'm in Portugal right now. We're both from New York, right? But both currently abroad. And in Portugal, you know, I'm so interested in observing the culture and the health of the people and their habits and sort of getting a sense for their physical health and their mental well-being. So with gut health, in America, in like our crazy life these days, it's important to avoid foods like gluten, like dairy, like sugar, and one that's a little bit less talked about is the industrially processed vegetable oils. That's things like corn oil and canola oil and soybean oil. The reason your future grandfather-in-law can say like, you don't have to worry about organic, I didn't and I'm fine, <laughs> is that's just sort of exactly the thing is that sort of we have to work at it in America to eat in a way that he's just eating as the default setting in India. And that's changing. It's changing in India. We've really, the United States has exported so many things. You know, we've exported music and that's great, but we've also exported like our deranged agricultural practices and our obesity epidemic. And so that's all now spreading across the world at a rapid rate. But um, 92 years ago, things were quite different, especially in India. So one thing that your future grandfather-in-law has going for him is that he actually probably had less hygiene that he grew up with. So he probably has a more diverse gut flora. And we kind of think like, ew, but what it took to get there was less hand washing, more flies buzzing around, landing on animal feces, landing on food, kind of spreading that flora. So basically, you know, where it's less of a sterile hygienic environment, you get a more diverse gut flora, and that's really good at training your immune system. When you have really diverse beneficial bacteria in your gut, your immune system understands tolerance and it's and understands like, okay, that's other, it's not me, but it's but it's cool. That bug is okay. And it learns to kind of what I call, can we curse? Yes. It's like a, a calm the fuck down. You know, it like just teaches your immune system to CTFD, calm the fuck down. And so basically now when we live in such a hygienic standard, our immune system doesn't get quite that tolerance training and it really starts to freak out at actually benign allergens. There's also the issue, which is that when we have intestinal permeability, also called leaky gut, then we start to leak things into our bloodstream. And that's where I think it's actually very justifiable that our immune system is provoked and starts to attack things. So, you know, your grandfather-in-law, like he has probably a very intact gut lining. Things aren't leaking into the bloodstream and it's not provoking his immune system. So in the U.S., I think at this point, part of the reason where so many of us are kind of orthorexic and crazy about organic food and about gluten is is kind of because things have gotten so deranged in the United States that it's brought us to a tipping point where you can't just eat and feel okay. I want to take a quick break to share with you guys an incredible resource if you're at all confused about organics, non-GMOs, what's healthy, what's not, what you should eat, what you should avoid. You have to check out my book, The Real Food Grocery Guide. After compiling hundreds of client questions about what to eat and what to choose at the grocery store, I researched and created this extremely thorough guide that will cut through the confusion and overwhelm that you feel at the grocery store. It's five-star rated on Amazon, and it's also been called the most practical guide to healthy eating by renowned physician and researcher, Dr. Dean Ornish. The Real Food Grocery Guide has been featured in InStyle, Dr. Oz, Well and Good, and many, many more. So if you're confused and overwhelmed about what to eat, check out The Real Food Grocery Guide, available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. You know, I think that I love the mentality of when I come to Europe, I actually just eat. I eat everything. I'm not the same obsessive organic farmer's market person that I am in the United States. And I just, I drink the beer, I drink the cappuccino, I eat the pasta, I eat the gluten and the dairy, and I'm fine. 
And I really, I get it that people want to say, oh, but you're in vacation mindset. And we can talk in a minute about the fact that I've fully tested this theory for myself in places like Hawaii, where I'm in vacation mindset, but on American soil, eating American agricultural products, I react to American food no matter what. So the same foods, if I were to eat them in the United States, I'd have acne and constipation and bloating and brain fog. So basically, I think that that's why you see this early wave of all of us like crazies in the wellness world being so obsessive about organic food is that our food is so deranged. Our Roundup alone, just being sprayed on everything is making us have leaky gut and making us react to so many foods. So like very long answer to your question, gluten, dairy, exactly. sugar, <laughs> vegetable yeah. oils. Yeah, no. And I love that answer and it makes a ton of sense. And You know, I think that's something people don't realize is that American food standards are very different than standards in other parts of the world. So our meat standards, for example, what is our conventional is not allowed to be sold in Europe, right? Because the standards are too low, right? They have more restrictions on what chemicals and things can be used on for example, their agricultural products, uh, what can be fed to the animals, to the livestock. So they have a lot more stringent standards, even for their quote unquote conventional foods. Mm -hmm. So whereas, okay, maybe when you're in Europe, it's not as important when you're back in the US, it's definitely something that you want to be aware and cognizant of. Yeah, even Roundup, right? So that's just barely, I think, being allowed to be fed to livestock is produce sprayed with Roundup, whereas in the US, it's fed directly to the people in spades. So we're exposed to this compound that the World Health Organization has acknowledged as a probable carcinogen. And at this point, Bayer, who purchased Monsanto, has paid out, I think, in the billions of dollars in lawsuits for people who have, the court has agreed, like this product caused their cancer. So this is something that we're just directly eating. Babies are eating. It shows up in umbilical cord blood. Like we're all exposed to it in such a heavy amount in the United States. Sometimes I wonder if that alone is really makes a difference in terms of our health outcomes in the U.S. Yeah, for sure. And the point that you brought up is that we're raised differently. Like now doctors are scheduling C-sections. You know, if you have a vaginal birth, it's probably less common in, in certain cities for sure. You know, where we, so for the grandfather's 92nd birthday, he took the whole family, like almost, I think 16 of us on a cruise Mm -hmm. and on the cruise ship, it was my first cruise. But every time you walk into a dining hall or whatever it is, they have these Purell hand sanitizers everywhere and everyone's using them. And I'm like, no, like I'll wash my hands, you know, in the bathroom with regular soap. But I I was steering clear of those things because we're just so used to being so sterile that it makes sense that we're kind of these delicate flowers in terms of when we're exposed to whatever these agricultural chemicals and certain foods that it's really hurting us and causing the acne and digestive issues and autoimmune and all this other stuff. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that the Purell also contains BPA. So you're getting this exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. And when you really think about the scheduled C-sections, your future grandfather-in-law probably born at home. You know, probably, (laughs) you know, they didn't have electricity, you know, he studied under like street lamps and, uh, you know, things were definitely way different in those days. And he has a a stomach of steel, really, like he could quite literally eat anything and be okay. But then it's like the, you know, two generations later, and it's like any little thing is a huge problem. So... Of course. Yeah. It's something that, um, you know, he was doing yoga and eating organic and doing home birth long before it was cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. He's the original. We had a shirt made for him. said like made in 1927 or something like that. (laughs) Um, All right. So let's talk about then. Well, first, let's start with food. So we know we need to avoid the dairy, the gluten, the sugar, refined vegetable oils. What should we be focusing on and making sure that we're getting every day? Yeah. And I would say like to caveat that, not everyone always, it's more like these are the likely culprits. And if people want to do a little bit of self-experimentation, if you're not feeling well, if you're always bloated, always constipated, alternating between constipation and diarrhea, if you're having stomach cramps, all of these reasons to suspect something's not agreeing with your stomach, those are places to look first. And there's a lot of different philosophies on where you start in a conventional world. People would say like, that's IBS and you should start by getting off of FODMAPs, which if I think I can translate that, it's fructo oligosaccharide disaccharide 
monosaccharides and polyols, I think. But so basically, you know, these are foods that are kind of difficult to digest by a compromised digestive system. So if you are in a state of poor gut health, then getting off of those foods does help symptomatically at least because you're kind of not challenging your digestive tract quite as much. I don't think of it as a definitive solution. And I think it's sometimes it's too restrictive. It can be too difficult for some people to follow. And it gets you off of a lot of otherwise healthy foods like artichoke or broccoli. You know, these are challenging to digest. So I think better to actually more fundamentally heal the gut. And then your digestive system works enough that you can handle artichokes and broccoli. And then some people are fine with dairy. Some people are fine with gluten. I think nobody should really be having industrially processed vegetable oils. And we should all be eating way, way, way less sugar, though I think it's generally okay to eat fruit. So that's a place to start. But then what you want to include, this is where I think so many of us in the health space get it really wrong because we get really fixated on what to eliminate and what to take out. And, you know, people get very focused on clean eating and not getting exposed to the bad foods or the toxins. And what we miss is how to eat a nutrient-dense diet, how to eat like your great-great-great-grandmother ate. And this is partly because, especially in the States, we just don't have any traditional food culture. We've been totally, you know, we sold that to the highest bidder. So our traditional food culture is like, you know, start the day with cereal and orange juice and a glass of skim milk. You know, Basically like, anything out of a box. Mm-hmm. Anything that someone can make a really good profit on because it's shelf stable and sugary and addictive and not nutrient dense and therefore not satiating. And so we kind of have to get back to the traditional food culture that makes the most sense for your genes. And if you're kind of a purebred, you know, if you know your ancestors, you can be like, okay, well, what were my great, great, great grandparents eating? If you're like me and sort of a mutt, you have to be a little bit more creative, but just sort of, then you just tune into your body and listen and figure out what does agree with your body. But generally what I think that looks like is that your plate should be about a quarter well-sourced protein, about a quarter safe starch. So a starch from a starchy vegetable like sweet potato or squash or plantain or taro or yucca. And then about half of your plate is some kind of vegetables, preferably prepared with liberal amounts of healthy fats. So maybe greens sauteed in ghee, or if you're having a salad, there's really good olive oil on top of it. And I think overall, we just need to be re-educated into embracing all of the different kinds of meat, all of the different cuts of meat, that fattier cuts of meat are okay, eating the skin is okay. I think of it that like as long as something is real food and this was a healthy animal, this is not a factory farmed animal, a pasture raised animal, that there is no wrong meat to eat or no wrong part of the animal. It's more just that you want to eat a variety and you want to listen to your body because it will tell you what you're needing in that moment. If we can kind of lose all of the programming and conditioning that told us like white meat is better or you know pork is bad or red meat will give you a heart attack, if we can strip away all of that programming and conditioning and just listen to our body, it'll tell us today I want fish or today I want lamb. And it will show you with cravings what micronutrients you need. Yeah. And I love that philosophy to focus more on what you can have than focusing on what you can't have, because I think that's Mm. what trips people up when they realize, oh my God, I can't have anything. You know, my, all my favorite foods are out. I have nothing to eat. That's when they don't stick to a healthier way of eating because that's what they're focusing on. When you focus on all of the delicious and nutritious things you can have, it becomes a lot easier. Our world does make it difficult though. So it's really easy when you're cooking for yourself at home to eat this delicious, abundant, indulgent way of eating real foods. And then I'm no stranger, I'm sure you aren't either, to the fact that when you're out in the world and trying to eat in a convenient way, it's really tough. The world is not, like I was saying this on a recent podcast, it's not Whole30 Island out there. Like you're not everywhere you turn, just real foods on offer. It's basically combinations of gluten, dairy, and sugar. And that's what you can buy conveniently out in the world. So it gets really difficult. True. Yeah, it's true. But you know what? I think that we're so lucky to live in the age of the internet. So at least in major cities anyway, you can use, like I use an app called Happy Cow that will show you restaurants that are more vegetarian friendly. So those are usually good. And it will usually include places that are organic or paleo or things like that, where you can get better options or just whenever I'm traveling somewhere, that's the first thing I Google is organic restaurants in or healthy <laughs> restaurants in, paleo restaurants. And inevitably, wherever you go, there's at least that one place that, that has, yeah. has something. So 
you know, again, it, it just becomes a matter of also knowing how to order things or asking for substitutions, asking for things, asking for them to maybe use olive oil instead of canola oil on whatever they're cooking mm-hmm. or whatever the case is. But yeah, I definitely hear you that it's it's a lot easier when you're home and you have control over what you're cooking because you don't even realize a lot of these restaurants are using MSG, right? It's out of Chinese restaurants because people know that it was used in Chinese food. So you'll see that all the Chinese restaurants say no MSG, but your fancy, you know, Mm five-star restaurant may still be using it. So you taste something and you're like, this is so good. It's almost too good. There's MSG in that. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. And I had a friend that went through chef school and she was, you know, interning at different top restaurants in New York City. She's like, you would be amazed how many of these places are using MSG and you'd have no idea. So yes, definitely cooking at home is really helpful to know what you're actually consuming. And but the consciousness now, around meat, I think is really helpful to know with restaurants because I, I've had a lot of patients, a lot of friends who are like, well, I eat vegetarian at home and I'll just have meat when I'm out in the world. And I think if anything, you almost want to flip that because at home you can control the quality of how you're sourcing meat. And that's important both for your physical health, but also on a more ethical level, what kind of farming practices you are supporting with your money. You don't want to support the factory farms that are really a truly inhumane experience for the cows. You want to be supporting pasture-raised meat. That's easier to do when you're buying buying it from a butcher and cooking it for yourself at home. In restaurants, if you're not certain that this is a place that's like, we source our meat at, you know, happy hollow peekaboo farm, you know, and they're saying that in bold and italics on the menu, then when in doubt, this is factory farm meat. Of course it is because they need to cut costs. They need to make food delicious. Corn fed meat is going to be more delicious than grass fed meat. And so when you're at a restaurant, if you can't be certain it's good meat, I actually recommend just eating vegetarian when you're out in the world, which is delightful as well. And yeah. someone cooks all these vegetables for you and it's a treat. Yeah, that's exactly what I advise at well. I say be a vegetarian when you eat out and at home, that's where you can be more paleo and eat your meat. And you, you know, you brought up this point before that people sometimes don't even realize all the variety of options we have when it comes to animal products. Like we think there's beef, chicken and shrimp or fish mm-hmm. and that's it. You know, we don't think about bison or I was just in Norway. They had moose burgers everywhere. So I tried a moose burger, something I never thought I'd do, but it was actually delicious. So, you know, there's all these other types of meat and in many cases, they taste even better than what you're used to. So it's okay to be a little adventurous. And I think now at farmer's markets, for example, they'll have sometimes availability of these different types of meat or even online. There's so many online resources now where you can buy direct from the farm for the bison or whatever else, you know, is available. Yeah. U.S. Wellness is one of my favorites, which I think is like grasslandbeef.com. And that I'll point a lot of my patients to, especially when I have patients who are not living in New York City or major cities where they have a bougie, fancy grass-fed butcher, then anybody can order from U.S. Wellness. And that's really well-sourced, really good quality meat. And you can really eat such a variety of different animals, different parts of the animal. It's not just the sort of like overplayed beef, chicken, muscle meat that we're all constantly eating. Yeah, for sure. That's a great tip. I actually haven't used that. So I'll have to check that one out. So and then less meat overall is worth pointing out as well. Sorry. So just less meat is a wonderful thing too, because basically, you know, when we look at your future grandfather-in-law, he's probably eating either a vegetarian diet or a semi-vegetarian diet. And when we look at the blue zones, these places in the world where people tend to live the longest, those are almost universally semi-vegetarian diets. So it's not that you eat vegetarian. It's not the total absence of animal foods, but it's also not the sort of more like American or like the wrong takeaway of the paleo diet, which is like that your plate is just a huge chunk of meat or a stack of bacon. You know, it's sort of like meat as a condiment, meat as something to include, but it's not necessarily the main event. Your main event is still vegetables. For sure. Yeah. I like that whole, that idea that your meat is the side dish and not the main dish because it's very often reversed in the U.S. Yeah. Speaking of that, though, I'm curious because I know on your website, you talk about also helping people with autoimmune disease, right? And as it relates to mental health. So, well, first off, I'm curious, what should we know in terms of autoimmune disease and mental health? How do they influence each other? Well, let's start there and then I'll ask you my follow-up question. Yeah. So it's actually a pretty complicated question. So I think that in a way, on a most cut and dry physical level, when someone has autoimmune activity in their body, that's heightened inflammation, it's immune dysregulation, like the immune system sort of gone awry, and then there's systemic inflammation. So 
whenever there's inflammation throughout the body, whether it's attacking the skin or the joints or the gut, it is also attacking the brain. So, so often you see with someone with autoimmune disease, they're also going to have some mental health manifestations. And that looks a little different in everybody. I think of it almost like these are different covers of the same song. So some people, it looks like depression. For some people, brain inflammation looks like anxiety. For some people, it's bipolar. For some people, they just can't focus. And so, you know, you'll see it track a lot. But then I think there's also this other important, more subtle aspect of autoimmunity, which is that when someone has early childhood adverse events, when someone has trauma, there's higher rates of autoimmunity. So I think it behooves us to start to talk about the fact that not in every case, but in a lot of cases of autoimmunity, there is a sort of deep psychospiritual issue, whether it's shame or guilt or feeling like things are hopeless or I don't deserve to be well or I don't belong or, you know, whatever it is that early childhood adversity created, uh, you know, whatever schema in the mind that it creates, I do believe that contributes to the body attacking itself. So when I'm treating someone with autoimmunity, yes, I want to heal their gut and I want to change their diet and I want to detox and, you know, all of these things to approach things on a physical level, but I think of it as like a mountain that we're summiting in a few different paths. And there's the physical path, but I think there is also the psycho-spiritual or even energetic or vibrational path. So I want someone to be stepping into a place of self-love. I want someone to do really deep healing of old wounds so that they're no longer feeling that shame and that guilt from early childhood experiences. I think it's all a part of the puzzle when it comes to autoimmune disease. Yeah, that's so interesting that you, I mean, obviously it makes sense, right? But you're taking a very multi-pronged approach to dealing with autoimmune because I know one of the really popular ways that's talked about a lot now, especially in the wellness community, is the paleo autoimmune protocol diet, which is pretty, it's not more meat heavy than vegetables. Still, vegetables make up the larger share of the plate, but there is a very large emphasis on the animal products. So I'm just yeah curious, in your opinion, in terms of diet, then when you're helping people with autoimmune, do you prescribe to that autoimmune paleo protocol or what, what are your thoughts on that in general? Yes and no. So I'm usually, I'm such a realist and I want to make things realistic and accessible for my patients. So like in a perfect world, if we did live on Whole30 Island, like I would probably have most of my patients with autoimmune disease on the autoimmune paleo or AIP diet. But it's so damn hard that sometimes that becomes counter therapeutic because then what you're doing is you're isolating someone, you're making it harder for them to socialize and go to restaurants with friends. You're making them have to do this like part-time job of sourcing and preparing their own food. And so I tend to think that like that's, it gets to be like one step forward, two steps back as we're getting somebody healthier. So what I'll do instead is, you know, if someone's like, oh, I cook for myself and my family all the time. I love cooking. I already own an Instant Pot. No problem. Then I'll say like, great, let's do the autoimmune paleo diet. But if I'm treating a 20 something who's like still out there trying to, you know, meet a partner and establish friendships, like it's just too much. Sometimes it's too isolating. So in those cases, like maybe features of the autoimmune paleo diet, but with some balance, a little bit more of an 80-20 approach. I don't think AIP has to be so meat focused. It's, I think bone broth can end up being really helpful. It's very helpful for healing up the gut lining. I think in the early phases of anybody who has had a period of time of being a vegetarian or vegan in a way that got their body out of balance, which isn't true for everybody eating a vegetarian or vegan diet. But for a lot of my patients, a lot of people with sort of like depression, anxiety, and autoimmune disease, I'll see, and I, you know, there's no judgment here. This was me too. I'll see a period of like 10 years of vegetarianism, but it was sort of like crapitarianism, you know, where it's like, yeah, it's technically vegetarian, but it's pizza. And so, French fries. Um, yeah, or Luna bars. And so, basically, you know, then you'll see somebody who I think actually has a little bit of like a red meat debt to pay back. And so, for those folks, I actually want them to eat a pretty decent amount of red meat and fatty cuts of meat initially, just to sort of replete whatever the zinc or just the blood building essence of that is. Once they've repleted it, then we sort of resume meat should just be a condiment. This is, you know, you, you get back to a point where your body's intuition is telling you how much. But early on, I think we need to overrule because there's just so much conditioning that meat is bad. So like I'll have somebody eat more initially and then 
get down to a place where they're not eating quite as much. But ideally where you want to get with everyone is that their their own body's intuition and craving is guiding them in terms of how much or how little to eat. But a lot of us are so many layers removed from that intuition that it sometimes requires a little proxy guidance. Yeah. Well, I think also we're sometimes taught to rely on outside people, primarily doctors, right, to tell us what to do with our body. And we feel like we don't know what to do. Like our cravings, we think of cravings as bad, right? Because the cravings are typically for, we think we want junk food or we want candy or whatever it is. So people are very removed from their body and they don't even know, you know, like (laughs) what's going on and, you know, anything below their neck, they have no idea what's going on. So I think it does take a little time and effort to actually get to that place where you can listen to your body and you can hear the cravings and you can start to understand that, but it's definitely possible. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, I think there's two kinds of cravings, really. There's drug cravings, then there's actual nutritional cravings. And so when you're having a craving, you basically just want to ask yourself the question, like, am I craving a real food or a drug? So if you're craving pizza or ice cream or something sugary, that's a drug craving, you know, no harm, no shame. It's just like that, know it for what it is. We've all been at this point, like if you made it through your life, not addicted to all of these foods, you know, good for you. But basically, you know, if it's gluten, if it's dairy, if it's sugar, If it's a processed food, which seem to always have like flavor crystals or sometimes MSG, that's a drug craving. And then if you're like, I really want a juicy red steak or I really want a salad or a salmon, that's probably a nutritional craving. Yeah. So I think that some of the most common issues, especially that I see amongst my peers and clients, is that a lot of people are dealing with stress feelings of depression and anxiety. So in terms of lifestyle, what are some things we can do lifestyle wise that's going to help ease some of these feelings? So lifestyle wise for easing anxiety, let's say I think my favorites are going to bed early, getting the phone out of the bedroom, building small amounts of exercise, and then just erring on the side of eating real food. And so basically, you know, sleep is probably our best medicine. It's free. It feels good. It really heals whatever ails us, including anxiety. But in our modern life, we have so many barriers to getting good sleep. And a big part of that is actually electricity and artificial light and certainly all the screens and electronics that go with that. So that's making us artificially awake late into the evening. So what you want to do is dial down on electronics, have like a little bit of a stopping point where you shut down your computer, don't look at Instagram any longer. And then that way your brain can start to get tired. And then you want to aim to have an earlier bedtime. Something in the range of 10, 10, 30, 11 is really fantastic if you can manage it. Getting the phone out of the bedroom is a profoundly impactful intervention because basically then you're not looking at that blue spectrum light screen right before bed. You're not going to bed right next to that thing that's full of all these stimulating associations, stressful associations like work email and geopolitical news crises and all of this, like right next to us, online dating, social media. So you want that out of sight, out of mind when you're sleeping. And then it also changes how the morning goes. You sort of set your own intention for the day rather than just being led passively by whatever notification pushed to the top of your phone. And then, you know, everyone freaks out. They're like, it's my alarm clock. And like, it turns out you can get an alarm clock. They sell them. <laughs> we forgot. We forgot that there was actually a thing called an alarm clock before phone. <laughs> cell phones. So it's a $10 on Amazon and I highly recommend it as a great life improvement. And then exercise, I mean, some people are just in a good group of exercise, and that's fantastic. But for so many of my patients, they're not. I'm, you know, myself, like a working mom, and I find it so difficult at this point to build exercise in. And so I like for people to lower their standards around exercise and basically just rather than the two hour door to door full yoga class experience or the soul cycle, whatever, instead of that, just carve out five or 10, maybe 15 minutes in your own living room where you do some calisthenics, you hold plank pose, you do a little bit of yoga, a little bit of Pilates or just some push ups, And that alone will get you a lot of the benefits, but it's so realistic and sustainable. And then the real food thing, I think for anybody who's like half committed to making changes, like they're feeling a little depressed, they're feeling a little anxious. They're like, what the hell were these women talking about with the autoimmune paleo diet? You know, if you're not there yet, but you just want to feel a little bit better, I think just erring on the side of real food. And that's a compass that we can all carry around in our pocket all the time. It's like you're at the restaurant or you're at your friend's house or you're 
at home and it's like, what should I eat? Just eat something real, eat real food that grew in the ground or it was a healthy animal. And if it doesn't fit either of those descriptions, like it's not really real food and you want to minimize the fake food in your life. For sure. And just going back to what you were saying about exercise, I love that you said exercise, but not too much. I think sometimes we get this idea in our head that we need to do a super intense one hour plus workout. And the truth is you don't really like even just walking. So one habit that I got into that I really love is that whenever I have a phone call with a client or you know a company that I'm working with that's 15 or 30 minutes, I'll take it, I'll just go outside and put my headset on and take it while I'm walking around the block. Even yeah. that is good enough. Or there are so many YouTube videos now. If you're like, oh, well, if I'm at home, I don't really know what to do. I can do a plank and crunches, but I don't know what else. There are millions, literally millions of YouTube yeah. videos free that you can um, check out. There's one that I love, Lily Sabri, Lean with Lily. Her channel is amazing. And I'm sure there's tons more. But don't make excuses. Even if you have that 10, 15, 30 minutes, that's totally sufficient. Yeah, it can be free and it can be quick. Exactly. So you mentioned a little bit about the food. Any supplements for anyone who is dealing with a lot of stress, anxiety, anything just sort of generally that you know we should be looking to replenish? I mean, yes and no. I'm always hesitant to go down the whole supplement path because what I've learned through many years in practice, people are just like, okay, get to the part where you just tell me what supplements to take. <laughs> right. And, and like, they bypass the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so, yeah, just like, oh, so I was just like wasting everyone's time by talking about sleep, <laughs> getting the phone out of the bedroom. Nobody wanted these interventions. No one wants to do the effortful stuff. It's just like, pull me the pill. So, you know, yeah, there are things that help. I think the one I feel most comfortable recommending on a broad level is magnesium glycine which is very safe and very necessary and helpful. Most of us are depleted in magnesium and it helps with so many of the problems of modern life. Like it, repleting your magnesium level helps with insomnia and anxiety, helps with migraines and headaches and menstrual cramps and muscle tension, constipation, and even with like cardiovascular health. So it's a wonderful thing for us to replete. I could go on and on and we could talk about the valerian roots and the L-theanine and you know all of these different supplements. But for the most part, I actually don't like my patients to take that many supplements. I think that it's a distraction from the fact that your nutrition comes from food and your well-being comes from sleep and community and exercise and sunshine and fresh air. And like to think it comes from a plastic bottle is bananas. I love that you said that. I really do. I know that people always ask me that question. So I wanted to ask you, but yeah. And, and what's a great source of magnesium, dark leafy greens, which mm -hmm. most people are not eating nearly enough of. So I always try to recommend people are getting them in at least your lunch and dinner meals, if you can getting in a good hefty serving, because that is going to make sure that you don't need to rely on those plastic bottles. Yeah. yeah. And also chocolate. <laughs> of magnesium. Um, okay. But don't rely on the don't... chocolate as your sole <laughs> source. I know. Sometimes I'm hesitant to be like, oh, yeah, I'm some chocolate, but also eat the greens. Yeah. So one question that I like to ask all of my guests on this show is if you can leave our listeners with just one tip or piece of advice for how they can live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Okay. So I actually, the fact that I'm in Portugal right now and so deep in observing this culture, I'm going to say something different than I would ordinarily say, which is that at every juncture of your life, choose people, like choose people over everything. You cannot go wrong if you are spending your time, your money, your resources, your effort, investing in your relationships, being generous, attuned to people, being a better listener, spending time physically with the people in your life. So, you know, basically have a Saturday, choose people, you know, have a Thursday evening and you want to take a walk, make a phone call instead of listening to a podcast, just at every juncture, choose people. I love that. That's really well said. Well, thank you so much for all of your wisdom and advice. And if people want to learn more, can you tell us where they can find you and remind us the name of the book and where they'll be able to find that? Sure. Yeah. So the best ways to find me are either on Instagram, I'm at Ellen Vora MD, or you can go to my website, which is ellenvora.com. 
And the book is like not really due out until like 2035. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> slow your roll but on that. Stay I'm tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. And I'm throwing back a lot of golden milks and try, doing my best to write quickly, but it, it'll take a while. And then another way, if you want to access my approach, I'm in September starting an online group. So that'll be like a small gathering of us over Zoom conference where we're just going to talk about my, my holistic approach to mental health. So that you can find out more about on my website. <laughs>